You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. We started the book of Mark a couple of weeks ago. And boy, there is a lot inside the book of Mark. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 15 this morning. So before we get started, I know we prayed a bunch, but man, you could not pray too much. Let's pray together. God, I want to say thank you for the chance that you've given me to share your word this morning. I ask that it not be me, but that it be your spirit working through me. Use me as your vessel, dear Lord, and rightly divide your word of truth to your people this day. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. Now these six verses here, there's not very many, and I know it's going to take a while to get through Mark doing this, but we want to cover it well. These six verses put together Jesus' baptism, his temptation, his announcement of the coming kingdom, and his call for people to believe and repent. That's what we're going to, that's kind of a summary of the six verses that we're going to look at. We're going to begin by looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 9. What we read there is that this time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Now I used to think Jordan River, and I thought Mississippi. And that, you know, it's not. It's like a creek. It's, you know, it's like Sugar Creek, or maybe even smaller than Sugar Creek. It's not that big of a river. And yet, John was out there, it says, in the desert. I kind of looked at the background. They don't know exactly where he was, but they're thinking that, they were, that he was down in the southern part, just north of the Dead Sea, in that desert, desert area around there, uh, baptizing people. It would have been downhill from Jerusalem in that area where he would have been baptizing. Jesus is making his way down to that spot, over just north of the Dead Sea Scroll areas, down the hill from Jerusalem to where John was baptizing. Now he was in Nazareth, and if he went to the place where they believed John was baptizing, he would have passed right through the city of Jerusalem. And you know what's in Jerusalem? The, the temple was there. It was there in Jerusalem. And that meant that all the religious elite were there in Jerusalem. It would seem like Jesus would have looked to the religious elites in Jerusalem for affirmation as he was about to begin his ministry. That's what it would seem like. But Jesus completely skipped the temple. Completely skipped the religious elite. In fact, the religious elite would eventually become Jesus' greatest opposition. True story. Jesus was on his way to the Jordan River with an overwhelming resolve, passed right by all these doctrine-holding folks, and headed down to the wilderness to this guy dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, eating bugs and honey. He headed right down to John. And it's here that Jesus will be baptized by his cousin John, in earthly terms, by his cousin John. Now here's the thing. Mark told us early on that John was baptizing. He said it, we read it last week, for the forgiveness of sins. That's just what it says right there. But Jesus had no sin. So why in the world did Jesus need to be baptized? To fulfill the prophecy, he says literally to fulfill all righteousness. Because it's the right thing to do. I loved what one of my preacher friends, he was my associate minister out in Oklahoma. He was 
working with the seniors. John McPhail was working with the kids, and I had everybody. Um, he said, my Lord and Savior was Jesus Christ, and you ain't a bit better than he was. Doesn't that about sum it up? He was sinless. How many of us can say that we are? We all need forgiveness. It is here, along the Jordan River, that Jesus is about to begin his three-year ministry, leading to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. I'm going to get to meddling here. If you've not been baptized, if you've not given your life to Christ in front of people, you need to understand how important it was to Jesus. Jesus had no sin at all, and yet he wanted to set the example for us to fulfill all righteousness, to make sure that he fulfilled the prophecy. He was wanting to do what needed to be done. Jesus himself submitted to baptism. If Jesus needed to do that, why in the world do you think you don't? For us, it's beyond important. It's imperative that we let everyone know whose side we're on. When we are baptized into Jesus Christ, it's like putting on the wedding ring. You know, nobody wants to say, I'll marry you someday. They want to say, look, we put on the ring. We're committed to one another for a lifetime. That's what Jesus is wanting to say. I'm committed to you for a lifetime. Remember, it's not just the baptism. We talked about that last week. The word synecdoche is part stand for the whole. It's hearing what he's got to say. It's believing it. It's being able to turn away from your old way of life. It's confessing him before men so that he can confess you before the Father. It's being baptized into him so that you can be raised by your faith to walk in newness of life. It's that whole thing. When we say you're saved by baptism, that's what we mean. When we're saying you're saved by grace, that's what we mean. When we say you're saved by faith, that's what we mean. When we say that you're saved by confession, that's what we mean. It's the whole any part of it stands for the whole. It's coming in submission to Jesus Christ. That's what God wants each and every one of us to do. Let's move on. Chapter 1, verse 10. It says this. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending like a dove. Now as he was coming up out of the water, it tells us a couple things. If he's coming up out of the water, it means he went down into the water, right? You can't come out of that which you've not gone into in the first place. So Jesus has been down in the water. And between that and the word that was used, the word is baptizo. And the word baptizo means to dip or plunge. We get a pretty good picture of what happened to Jesus. He went down in the water and he was dipped or plunged in the water and he came back up out of the water. It's a really good picture of what baptism should entail. Now there are other words that they could have used. There's the idea of rantizo, which is to sprinkle. There's the idea of keo, which is to pour. And there's baptizo, which was to dip or immerse. You know the only one of those words, the only one used in the entire New Testament is baptizo. You never find any of those other words. There's not a word for pouring used about ba baptism. There's not a word for sprinkling used about baptism. It's always immersion. That's why in the Christian church, we immerse people and we bring them back up by their faith. If you don't have faith, all you're going to do is get wet. Because it's only by faith that your heart is circumcised and made clean. God's Holy Spirit does that for us. It's not the magic words of the preacher. It's not the hydrogen and oxygen coming together into something we call water. It's the Holy Spirit at work in your heart. It's an inward thing that happens. And baptism is letting everybody know that you are trusting God for that to happen in your heart so that your sins will be removed. The Gospel of John makes it clear that John the Baptist, after Jesus was buried in baptism and raised back up, it makes it clear that he saw something miraculous. He says the heavens, the word there literally means were ripped apart. Now Matthew and Luke, they use a little simpler word for that. They use the word the heaven was opened. You know, just kind of in comparison to Mark's word, it just means it was opened. But Mark says it was more than just open. It was ripped open. And what he says there, the word he uses there, is the same word that is used whenever it says at Jesus' death, the temple veil was rent asunder. The same word is used. It was ripped apart. The heavens were ripped apart when Jesus come up out of that water. That same word used for that temple veil lets me know this wasn't something simple. 
This was an overwhelming thing that John the Baptist saw and that he related and that Peter related to Mark. And Mark is putting it down in writing so that we can have it today. It's a startling, startling memorable event as the heavens are ripped open. You almost think that with the heavens being ripped open that way, that you should be able to look up and see the heavenly host and hear him singing. But that's not in there. Doesn't say anything about the heavenly host singing. Nothing about seeing the angels in heaven. What it says is that the heavens were ripped open and the Spirit of God descended like a dove. The word picture being painted there is would be like a dove that's flying along so gracefully and then it flaps its wings a little and lands on a tree branch. That's the picture being painted of the Holy Spirit coming down. It's like a dove gently landing on a tree branch. The Holy Spirit is coming down from heaven and John is trying to visualize it. He says, look at this. The heavens are rent apart. They're, they're torn open. And the Spirit of God is descending on this one who is my earthly cousin that you come to know as Jesus. Now that is an awesome word picture. And even though they've done their best to illustrate it, it pales in comparison to the reality of what must have taken place on that day. Let's move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It says there, And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Whose voice do you think that was? He was calling Jesus his son. God's voice. <laughs> the voice from heaven was speaking directly to Jesus. God the Father speaking to God the Son as the Holy Spirit is descending from heaven. You know what we have there? The three in one. All together at Jesus' baptism. Sure, John had heard the stories. We've talked about that before. He had to have been sitting around the table with Elizabeth and with Zachariah and with Mary and Joseph. He had to have heard the story about the Annunciation of Jesus' birth, the Annunciation of his birth, what happened to his father being unable to speak and probably even hear until he was born and they named him John like he was supposed to, the story about Jesus' birth in a stable laying in there. And you can just imagine, he's heard this all of his life. So for John, it's pretty realistic. But it's always been hearsay. Well, my mama and papa told me my aunt and uncle told me. But now, John was hearing from the mouth of God himself. This Jesus is my beloved son. And he's hearing it. God didn't talk to John. He talked to Jesus. He says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. For us to recognize Jesus' true identity... You and I have got to do this by experiencing the words and works of Jesus through the eyewitness accounts of others. In the case of John the Baptist, he heard it from God himself. And Mark's making clear that we understand it was God himself who declared, Jesus is my son and I am pleased with him. John saw the heavens ripped open. He heard God speaking directly to Jesus. And this vocal declaration solidified in John's mind all that he needed to know to believe in his own heart beyond a shadow of a doubt this is the one God has told me was coming. He knew everything that Mary and Joseph and Zechariah and Elizabeth had told him was absolutely true. He'll say later on were it not for this event of Jesus' baptism John will say later on, were it not for this event, I could not have been sure who the Messiah was. I, I heard my mom and dad talk about it. I heard Mary and Joseph talk about it. But I could not have been sure were it not for this. I saw the Holy Spirit descending just like I was promised I would. I am sure now. That's the final nail for me. I know Jesus is who he claims to be. Jesus is who Zechariah and Elizabeth said he was. Jesus is who Mary and Joseph said he was. In fact, we can read that in John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. It says, John saw Jesus coming toward him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this, can you just imagine pointing at Jesus, the Lamb of God, can you this is the Son of God. Have you got the picture? That's how sure John was at this point. Now a little later on, he may need some reassurances. Later on, while he's waiting ex execution, he's going to wonder about this. But for now, John knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was indeed the Lamb of God. Let's move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 12, as we continue on our journey this morning. At once the Spirit sent him into the desert. Now that word there, at once, it may be translated immediately. It's used over and over and over again in the book of Mark. I think some 40 times if you check them all out and look it up. That's because John wanted to make sure in his gospel he made it clear there was an urgency to the life and work of Jesus. Immediately, straightway, Jesus was driven into the wilderness. The Spirit drove Jesus out of the wilderness. Now that's such a contrast. Here's the Spirit just floating down like a dove and landing on Jesus. And then it says it drove him into the wilderness. Okay, Jesus, done with that. Get out of here. Get going. You, you see the, the abrupt change that Mark's showing you? Immediately, get out of here. Get going. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He didn't give him any time to celebrate his baptism. There was no welcome to the family, shaking hands. None of that stuff. He was driven out into the wilderness by that dove which had just gently, gently descended a short while before. Now here's the thing, friends. That unexpected abruptness that you find here, what's the hurry? Uh, the hurry was Jesus had come to redeem mankind. And it was important that he get the job done. So he left that Jordan River and he headed out there in order to do battle with Satan. From the moment God had affirmed to him and to the world who he was. Can't you just imagine as he's driven away from the Jordan, out of the desert, can't you just imagine, you can almost feel the chill that the warm air would have caused as it quickly evaporated that cool Jordan water from the skin of Jesus. God the Father had sent Jesus the Son to the world to, to bring defeat to sin and death and it's time to get that important work started. Therefore, there was no dilly-dallying. The Spirit drove him out to the battlefield where he will stand face-to-face, toe-to-toe with Satan himself. Jesus, God's only begotten, the word there is a fancy dancy word, and it's only used with Jesus, monogenes, only begotten one. The only begotten one? The only begotten one of God is going to be confronted by Satan and his minions again and again and again over the next 40 days. But Jesus, every time the attacks come, will overcome those attacks over and over again. In the process, Jesus will deliver Satan. Just a small taste of the defeat that's going to pour out on Satan in epidemic proportions when Jesus rises from the dead. Just kind of look at this, Satan. This is just a taste of what I'm about to give you later on. Just take a taste of this, Satan. And Jesus is laying it out there, putting it on the line. Each of the Gospels goes straight from the baptism to Jesus' temptation. That's how important it was. They didn't leave it out. But I've got news for you. The same is true today. When we're baptized, some of our most challenging trials will be at our doorstep. I believe that's true because when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we're telling everyone, I'm on God's side. And the devil's going to test that. Are you really? 
Are you really on God's side? The devil doesn't like this at all. He's going to do his best to make you turn away from God and back to him because he feels like he's losing one of his children. He doesn't like it when you give your life to God. The devil and his minions will come after us full force when we totally submit ourselves to the will of Almighty God. He knows our weaknesses and he'll do his utmost to exploit him and that makes me so dug unaggravated I can't hardly stand it. I hate it that Satan knows where my weakest points are. I hate it that he's always jabbing me in those points. And I'm guessing, if you've been alive for long, you know where, you, where your weak points that Satan gets you are, and you know that he's constantly meddling in those areas of your life. Because that's just the way Satan is. If you're expecting everything to smell like roses when you dedicate your life to God, then you're in for a really big disappointment. See, the Christian life is not an easy one. Along with the beautiful aroma of rose comes the pesky thorns. The pesky thorns. Let's move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 13. It says there, And he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. And he was in the wilderness there for 40 days. Did you know 40 is a really big number inside the scripture? It's used over and over and over again. It's used many, many times. For instance, God caused it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights to cleanse the world. Remember Noah and the things that went on there? Or how about this? Moses spent 40 years following sheep through the wilderness. 40 years out there as, as a shepherd until finally God called him to go deliver Israel. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. He's waiting up there for the law. So long up there, people got tired of waiting around and thought something must have happened to him. He'd been up there a long time. Another day of 40s. The Israelites were in the wilderness 40 years after they refused to go in and take Canaan like they had been told to, to do. Elijah journeyed for 40 days for Mount Horeb. And Jesus is tempted for 40 days. 40. Can you imagine? Man, if I go from breakfast and skip lunch and I get to supper, my stomach is growling. Saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. I say, you're big enough. You don't need that. But it still growls anyway. But Jesus had been out there without anything to eat for 40 days. And Satan was coming to test him. Now, here's the thing we need to look at. The word test and tempted, I struggle with that. Kim will tell you. I talk with her. I talk with Wally. Some about it. It's terribly difficult to know how to unfold these things and make them make sense. The, the word that's used there for tempt and test the context is what makes a difference in how you define it, how you put it inside the Word of God. The context will determine the definition, if you will. To tempt is to entice a person to do what's wrong. To test is to give a person the opportunity to choose what's right. And sometimes the same event can be both. <clears throat> it can be a test for one and a temptation on the other side of it. To tempt is to hope for failure. To test is to hope for success. It's the best way I know to describe it. For Satan, these were temptations being laid out before Jesus. He wanted him to fail. For Jesus, they were simply tests where he could prove he was who he said he was and that he was going to be faithful to God no matter what. In Jesus' baptism, God revealed his true identity as the Son of God. The Holy Spirit descended on him, empowering to do the work of Almighty God. Then the Spirit drove him out of the wilderness where Jesus stood toe-to-toe -to -toe against Satan. Mark doesn't describe a single temptation. He just says, and he went into the desert and was tempted. But if you go to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 3 to 10, it's going to lay some of those temptations out. For instance, it's going to say, the devil wanted him to take rocks and make bread. Well, now think about that for a minute. You know, in the Garden of Eden, the devil wanted him to eat a piece of fruit. And God has said not to eat. Now he wants Jesus to eat rocks that have been turned into bread. Start to see a little bit of correlation there? I did. Compare the garden where they were not sure of God's command and they said, well, you're not supposed to eat of it. You're not supposed to even touch it. And Satan changed the word, you won't surely die. Thou shalt not surely die. Remember that digression back and forth? It seems like Adam and Eve were just a little bit shaky on what God had to say, and they even took it a step farther than what God had to say. Not Jesus. He knew exactly what God had to say. And when he was tempted, he worded it right out there. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Move on to the second temptation. 
The devil says, throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple and let the angels save you up. Because scripture says, the angel's going to watch over you so you won't dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus says, I love the word there. The word, that, he says, that's why I'm not test the word that God. The, the word for test literally means to over test. You're not going to push God too far. This is pushing God too far. Because in essence, what the devil was saying if you jump off of here at the temple with all those people down there in the temple, in that temple area, and they see you falling to your death only to be wafted up by angels, they're going to want to follow you. And you won't have to die on the cross of Calvary. Can you get the picture of what Satan's trying to do to Jesus? And Jesus says, oh, contraire. It is written, you shall not test you shall not overtest. You shall not push the Lord your God too far, and that is too far. But he goes on, and Satan takes him out in high place, looking out over the, the earth. And he says, you see all that? You see, the, I, it's almost like he gave him a special sight so he could see even farther. You see all the nations out there? I'll tell you what, Jesus. I have power over them. I've got power over this earth. You want to be a king? I'll make you ruler over all that. If you'll just bow down and worship me, and you won't have to die on the cross of Calvary. Can you just imagine how Satan was tempting Jesus to, to take the easy way out? In each instance, Jesus answered with scripture. In this instance, he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Wow. In each instance, Jesus uses his God's word to combat the darts of the evil one. Mark includes a little side note. That would have been important to the Christians that he was writing to. Remember when we started talking about this early on with the introduction to the book of Mark? He said that the wild beasts were there with Jesus. Mark throws that in. You don't find it in a lot of other places. The wild beasts were there with Jesus. But for the people who were living during this time that Mark was writing in the, the persecution of Nero's, you remember what we talked about there? How he would take the skins of animals and drape them over the Christians and put them into the arena and turn a pack of wild dogs loose and watch them tear them to bits? Can you imagine how comforting it would be to know that when Jesus was out there, the animals just didn't mess with him? They knew the story of Daniel. They're reading the story of Jesus. If Jesus wants to, he can keep them safe from the wild dogs. But if he is not wanting to, they're perfectly willing to die in order that they can come home and be with him forever. I'll tell you what, Jesus could have delivered them, but he let many of them die. I can just imagine, though, that this would have been a comfort to those facing Nero's death squads. The angels that we didn't see at Jesus' baptism. Remember I said that it seems like we should have seen them when the heavens were ripped open? The angels we didn't see show up now says they minister to Jesus. He's gone through these temptations. He's overwhelmed by the things that he's faced. They've been with him all along, but now they come down and they minister directly to him. The same word used for minister there is the word that we get our word deacon from. They came down and they served Jesus, if you will. After he had given his all, starved himself for 40 days, 40 nights, they're fasting in the wilderness after he had overcome the temptations of Satan again and again. Really what's being painted here is the picture of two opposing camps. There's Jesus on one side and there's Satan on the other side. The picture being painted is of these two camps. The Holy Spirit and the angels are there with and for Jesus. But the devil's got the minions and the wild animals on his side. And they're standing in fierce opposition to Jesus and the angels. Mark doesn't give us any specifics, but Matthew and Luke make it clear Jesus passed Satan's test again and again and again. When Satan tempted Jesus to make bread from stones, he passed the test with the word of God. When he tempted him to jump off of the temple, he passed the test with the word of God. When he tempted him to bow down and worship him, he passed the test with the word of God. And that's a wonderful example for us. When we are facing temptations, we need to be so full of the word of God that it just oozes out from us. And we can say to Satan, but God says... But God says, the word of God is our offensive sword as we do spiritual battle with Satan. And so we should use that sword 
much like Jesus did. Let's move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now, in order to really get our minds wrapped around that, we need just a little bit of background to understand why this popular preacher of good news ended up in prison. I mean, everybody liked John. They were flocking to him by the thousands out there. Why in the world did he get thrown in prison? Well, here's the deal. Herod Antipas had stolen his brother's wife. And whenever John saw that he had stolen his brother's wife, he said, he ought not be doing that. That's just not the right kind of a thing to do. That's a sinful relationship that you should not be involved in. Well, Herod didn't like that, so Herod had John arrested and thrown into prison. And for some time he remained there in prison and just wondering, why God am I in here when I could be out there? Imprisonment gave John a lot of time to think. You just imagine sitting there in prison. Tick, tock, tick. They didn't have clocks like that back then. But you know what I mean? Time's just ticking by. At one point, he even began to question whether he had made a mistake. If I'm in prison here, what's going on out there? Is Jesus really the Messiah? Did I make a mistake about this? I mean, I heard the voice. I watched this heavens, but what's going on? Why? You can just imagine the confusion. He was imagining that maybe Jesus wasn't who I thought he was. Maybe I made a mistake. So he got some of his disciples together. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down and ask Jesus if I made a mistake. And this is how Jesus responded to them whenever they got there. It's found in Luke chapter 7, verse 22. So he replied to the messengers, the one that John sent down to check and see if Jesus was the one. And so he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached. <laughs> Snowden paraphrase? Yep. Jesus is exactly who he thought he was. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Sometime later, Herodotus' daughter, Salome, went out at Herod's birthday party, and she did the, they do those funny dances where they're like, well, evidently she had a lot of wiggle. Guys, you know, didn't like that. Didn't like that picture. Yeah, well, evidently she had a lot of wiggle because Herod really liked it. And he liked it so much that he made this overwhelming oath. I'll just give you everything I got up to half my kingdom. Anything you want, you just name it. That's how much that dancing please. He didn't even hurt your eyes when I tried it. Her, her mom used Herod's harsh oath as a way to end the life of John the Baptist. John was beheaded because an evil woman was uncomfortable with the fact that he had pointed out her sin of leaving her husband and moving in with Herod. Nevertheless, John had prepared the people for Jesus. He had done his job. He ushered in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We need to learn from this that even when we're 100% in the will of God, doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing, in exactly the place we're supposed to be doing it, even when we're 100% in the will of God, evil people can and evil people will do us great harm from time to time. It's just a reality. Mark began the gospel in verse 1 with these words. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We read in verse number 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news. Wow. Jesus not only preaches the good news... Jesus is the good news. The someone promised way back in Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, the one that John gave his life for was taking over the torch. Jesus was to become the one to establish the church through his word, his works, and his disciples. Jesus' message is laid out for us in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. The time has come for mankind to bask in the grace of Almighty God. That's the time that's come. The kingdom is, is near, it's right at hand. But to receive the benefit of the kingdom, one must repent and believe. Repentance denotes that which one turns from. Belief denotes that which one turns to. We repent from sin and death, leading to forgiveness and eternal life. 
the grace of God flowed down from that cross in the form of blood so that we might have an opportunity to hear, believe, repent, confess, be immersed, and live for Him. Are you ready to turn away from the life of sin leading to death? Are you ready to believe and trust in the grace of God? Trust Jesus for your salvation. If so, now's the time to come as we make an invitation time available to you. We want you to make your commitment publicly known in order that we can celebrate with you your commitment to Jesus. Won't you come as we stand and sing, Grace Flows Down. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.